one of Wisconsin's most notorious killers. I'm innocent. I won't do nothing to harm nobody. Freed from prison, <laughs> only to be convicted in a brutal murder. They plan on evidence. DNA doesn't lie. Now a decade later, Stephen Avery is back in the spotlight. The sheriff was told by the police, you have the wrong guy. The movie sparking a movement questioning his guilt. Don't in prison an innocent man. Tonight, 12 News goes beyond the headlines, the hype, what you didn't see when we take you inside the case files. Making a murderer is igniting a firestorm and is making international headlines. Most of you have heard of Stephen Avery and the murder of Teresa Halbach. In the next 30 minutes, we'll explore this fascinating case. You have asked hundreds of questions on Twitter and on our Facebook page. We will get to many of those and tell you where Avery's case stands tonight. But here's where it began, when Stephen Avery was convicted of rape, a crime he didn't commit. 1985, Avery is arrested for raping a woman on a Manitowoc beach. The victim identifies him in court. Avery maintains his innocence, but is sent to prison. 2003, the Innocence Project and DNA testing clear Avery's name. We know he didn't do it. <laughs> right, yeah. we stood behind him 100%. He's released from prison. I'm feeling fine now. Terrific. <laughs> 2003, newly released police records show the rape victim, Manitowoc police, and deputies within the Sheriff's Department had doubts Avery was the right man from the start. The report suggests they asked the Sheriff to look more closely at Gregory Allen, a known flasher who had already been arrested for another attempted sexual assault on the same beach. I think uh, there was a cover-up. 2003, the Attorney General conducts an investigation and clears the Sheriff's Department of criminal wrongdoing. 2004, Avery files a $36 million lawsuit against Manitowoc County for his wrongful conviction. 2005, a young photographer disappears. 25-year-old Teresa Halbach worked for Auto Trader magazine. Her final appointment, the Avery Salvage Yard. I got nothing to hide, so there should be nothing there when I say planted something there. Her charred remains are found on the Avery property. We love Teresa. We always will. She'll always remain with us. Avery and his nephew, Brendan Dassey, are charged in her death. Avery again maintains his innocence. They planted evidence. Have you ever planted any evidence against Mr. Avery? That's ridiculous. Have no, you? I have not. 2007, both go on trial. Are you willing to say that these two otherwise honest cops came across a 25-year-old photographer, killed her, mutilated her, burned her bones, all to set up and to frame Mr. Avery? They're not doing it to frame an innocent man. They're doing it to ensure the conviction of someone they've decided is guilty. Both are convicted, both serving life sentences. And nearly a decade after his murder conviction, Avery maintains his innocence. And 12 News' Colleen Henry has been following his case since his release from prison back in 2003. And Colleen, he wrote you a letter just last month. Uh, it's just one of several letters that Avery and his family have written over the years. Yeah, this latest letter, Kath, was his response to my request for an interview. I talked, asked him if he would talk about how making a murderer has affected him, and he wrote, the real killer is still out there. He goes on to say, I am really innocent of this case, and that is the truth. The truth will set me free. Of course, this case centers on a young woman from Calumet County. 25-year-old Teresa Halbach vanished on Halloween 2005. Now, the documentary suggests investigators targeted Avery from the beginning, but our case files show there were other suspects in their sights. The Avery salvage sign is a bitter reminder of a difficult time in these parts. Today, blue ribbons hang from the sign for Teresa Halbach, so she's not forgotten in the media frenzy of making a murderer. That was all my daughter. She shared the image on Facebook. We all got a heart. And people out there, they just don't think we do. Earl Avery and his brother Chuck still run the salvage yard, and despite the family's sympathetic portrayal in the documentary, he says his family continues to take the heat. They call us murderers, they call us everything else in the book. People pointing fingers at you and saying ah, maybe it was just, you and Chuck. Yeah, and that was just a bunch of bullshit. People are going to say what they want to say. They don't even know us. 
A decade ago, Stephen Avery made headlines when he was freed from prison for a rape he didn't commit. He was in the process of suing Manitowoc County for wrongful conviction when Teresa Halbach went missing. Day one. Photographer Teresa Halbach has three freelance shoots to photograph cars for Auto Trader magazine. She's never seen again. Day four. Halbach's mother calls police. Co-workers say she hasn't been to work in three days. Day five. Hello, this is Teresa with Auto Trader magazine. Investigators learn one of Halbach's last assignments was at the Avery Salvage Yard. Manitowoc's sheriff asked Calumet County to lead the investigation because of Avery's lawsuit. Couldn't believe it. You know, somebody missing? That's not good. Day six. We found a RAV4. Investigators ship it to the state crime lab for testing. Day seven. The crime lab finds human blood inside Hallbach's SUV. In Stephen Avery's trailer, investigators seize guns, handcuffs, leg irons. Day eight. On the seventh search of Avery's trailer, a Manitowoc investigator involved in Avery's lawsuit finds a car key in Avery's bedroom. To schedule me out again. And deep down, it hurts. Day nine. In a fire pit next to Avery's trailer, fire marshals find bone fragments and human teeth. Day 10. 12 News is on the phone with Stephen Avery as officers arrest him for gun possession. He's a convicted felon and can't have the two guns found in his trailer. While the documentary suggests the sheriff's department only targets Avery, investigators look at the entire Avery family. 12 News is there as they round up seven of Avery's relatives to get DNA samples, including Avery's brothers Chuck and Earl. Both have sex-related convictions. Finally, the crime lab confirms the teeth and bones found in Avery's fire pit are human, a shaken sheriff tells the Halbach family. Uh, that was very hard for me and I'm sure 20 times harder for them. Day 11. The crime lab reports four separate samples of Avery's DNA in Hallbach's car and Avery's DNA on that key found in his bedroom. A key they now know starts Teresa Hallbach's SUV. Day 12. It is no longer a question who is responsible for the death of Teresa Hallbach. The district attorney announces he will charge Stephen Avery with murdering Halbach and mutilating her corpse. Day 13. I didn't do nothing. Avery goes on the defensive. We planted evidence. I was going to be there. I won't harm her. She seemed like a nice girl. She did her job. And that was it. Avery is now serving a life sentence for murder. A decade later, his brother Earl believes Stephen was framed. I think he deserves another trial completely. Oh well, yeah, he was railroaded. His brother Chuck. Goodbye. Well, we'll leave if you'd like us to. I gotta go. <laughs> All right. And tonight, 12 News has learned members of the prosecution team have been in touch with the Halbach family to assure them if need be, they're prepared to try Stephen Avery again, Joyce. And speaking of the Halbach family, they've said little about the Netflix series. Her brother released a statement. It reads in part, we are saddened that individuals and corporations continue to create entertainment and seek profit from our loss. Making a murderer struck a chord with people around the world. Many of you are asking what happens next? I don't know if it's killing her or keeping her alive, one or the two. From the families to the legal fight, the documentary's lasting impact. And there have been significant advances in forensic testing. And where calls for a new trial stand. Plus... Hey, Steve, we've been waiting for you. What do you want to say? From his exoneration to his murder conviction, 12 News' Colleen Henry has covered Avery since day one. The key piece of the story, she says, was left out of the series. Scores marched outside the Manitowoc County Courthouse recently. Many came from across the country. Some calling for Stephen Avery's release, others saying 
He is where he belongs. Welcome back to Stephen Avery Inside the Case Files. The convicted murderer is in the process of asking for a new trial. He also has a new attorney. Kathleen Zellner is launching an independent investigation into the DNA evidence in Avery's case. She says her Chicago area law firm will do every forensic test available. Zellner even bought the same SUV Halbach drove. I want to examine what was not tested in the car that should have been tested. Since 2007, there have been significant advances in forensic testing. Zellner also says her team is looking more closely at other suspects in Halbach's death. Avery's nephew, Brendan Dassey, was just 16 years old when he was charged with helping his uncle rape and murder Teresa Halbach. He is now 26 and has an appeal pending in federal court. Just hours ago, 12 News spoke to his attorney. Robert Dvorak is working with Northwestern University's Center on Wrongful Convictions of Youth. He argues Dassey's first lawyer failed to protect his interests and that his confession was coerced. Dvorak says making a murderer has many questioning the law on how police conduct investigations. Inevitably, say, they say, you mean they can do that? You mean they can lie to you to get you to give a statement? It provides a huge service in educating and, and, and at least getting starting a discussion uh, about um, issues in criminal justice and how it works and what police can and can't do. Dassey has not seen the documentary, but his lawyer says he has gotten many letters from viewers. Just last month, the state moved Dassey from a prison in Green Bay to one in Columbia County without any explanation. Both are maximum security facilities. Making a murderer has created a media firestorm that's been difficult for some and provocative for others. Colleen Henry looks at its impact on everyone involved. Exhibit A. He may have his own Facebook fan page. Good morning, Your Honor. Uh, attorney Jerome Buting. But you can still find Avery attorney Jerry Buting fighting for clients in the courtroom. But Buting says making a murderer has made that more challenging. I do have an agent because I can't handle all of the, the emails and the contacts and uh, it's just overwhelming. I can't practice law anymore without somebody helping me. They've appeared on national news shows. Now Buting and co-counsel Dean Strang are taking their show on the road. A conversation on making a murderer is booking theaters across the country. My focus right now is on trying to deal with the systemic issues hopefully in a forum where we can have a good give and take about it. No offense, but two minutes on nightly news isn't enough. Despite the media juggernaut, Buting says no one's getting rich off the documentary. The two filmmakers didn't have deep pockets that they could go out and pay people. They asked people to participate, and you know those who did chose to do it. 12 News caught up with Avery prosecutor Ken Kratz in New York. I'm meeting with my agent and uh, some publishers uh, trying to finalize our, our deal. Kratz says making a murderer made him one of the most hated men in America. It also got him a book deal. Once I get to present uh, the entire uh, side uh, of the case, which was shown to the jury and even more that was shown to the jury. I think the general public will come back around to the same conclusion that the jury reached that Mr. Avery was guilty of murder and he's right where he belongs. Avery remains at Wapun Correctional where he now communicates with supporters via Twitter messages posted by his new Illinois attorney. Quote, I want everyone to know that no one in my family, including me, was involved in the murder of Teresa Halbach. It is obvious who killed Teresa, but Manitowoc cops chose not to investigate him so they could frame me. They call us murderers. They call us everything else in the book. Back at the Avery Salvage Yard, Brother Earl says the family's seen backlash and support after making a murderer. How are your mom and dad? They're almost 80 years old. They can only take so much. Is your mom still going back and forth all the time? Yes. Well, killing her? I don't know if it's killing her or keeping her alive, one of the two. Earl Avery still believes his brother was framed by Manitowoc Sheriff's investigators Andrew Colburn and James Link. What bugs me the most is that, that Colburn used to be my buddy and I don't understand him. I don't understand how he could do such a thing. And they call us animals, them guys ain't no better. The Averys haven't forgotten the young woman at the center of this case. The blue ribbons that hang from their salvage yard sign a reminder this story isn't entertainment, particularly for the family of Teresa Halbach. Coming up, we go behind the scenes of the Avery trial. What the hell happened? You saw 12 News Colleen Henry in several episodes of Making a Murderer. When you watch the docu-series, 
Was there anything that, that, that came back to you or maybe you said, well, what about this? The important facts about Avery, she says, were left out. And we heard from you on Facebook and Twitter. She's here to answer your questions about the case. From exoneration to conviction, 12 News investigative reporter Colleen Henry covered Stephen Avery's story for years. And you not only see Colleen in Making a Murderer, you hear from her too. Our Patrick Palantonio asked Colleen about the experience and what she feels the filmmakers left out. Hey Steve, we've been waiting for you. What do you want to say? I knew he was coming. We were standing there waiting and obviously it was the first opportunity we were going to have any chance to talk to him. and. I knew him a little bit, and I know he's a guy who wants to speak his mind, and I knew he wanted to speak. Hey, Steve, everybody's listening. What do you want to say today? I'm listening. <laughs> Jurors deliberated nearly eight hours before Of course, before the defense Colleen contends Avery's DNA was statements. planted by... In Chilton, Colleen Henry, WISN, 12 News. When you cover a trial, you get to know the people around you, especially when you're covering a trial for weeks, like the Avery case. What did you know about these filmmakers? Actually, they just struck us as students. They came in and introduced themselves and said, you know, we're students at NYU. We read the article in the New York Times, and we said, this is crazy, huh, isn't it? And we're going to just be here. And they showed up every day and seemed to be working hard, were very polite, very humble. They certainly portrayed themselves as people who had a lot to learn, very often asking our photographers for technical help, very good team players, nice people. You established it as November 3rd. and I'm We see you primarily in the media room there. Can you take us into that room? Because there are times when you might see the defense attorneys and the prosecution in the same room, one at the podium, one off to the side. Can you explain how that worked and what was going on behind the scenes? Sure. Think post-game sports. That's mm -hmm. basically what was going on every day. When you have a big trial like that, very often judges will try to corral and coordinate coverage so that it doesn't get out of hand. There was not only Milwaukee media, Green Bay, the entire state was covering this testimony. Every day at the end of testimony there would be a podium where any party that cared to speak would be available. So very often you would see Mike Halbach, for example, Teresa's brother, would come down. Why now? The defense would come down after key witnesses and they'd give their version of what was going on and then from time to time, less frequently, the prosecution came down case. and answered now. questions so that we understood what we'd just seen. If you have questions, we'll take two or three minutes. What the hell happened? <laughs> There were moments in the film that you could actually see the stress. Uh, and the stress, a lot of it was driven by the fact that post-game generally happened at the same time live shot time happened. When you watched the docu-series, was there anything that came back to you? Or maybe you said, well, what about this? I didn't see it. What I found missing from the documentary was some of the stuff that we had reported on uh, heavily, which was the background of Stephen Avery and the background of his family and why it was that Stephen Avery had been considered a suspect in the 1985 sexual assault he did not commit, why it was that investigators were looking at him again after Teresa Halbach disappeared. His brothers had rap sheets. There was reason for law enforcement to be very familiar with this family and it may not just have been they lived on the wrong side of the tracks and weren't Manitowoc upper crust. All week we've been asking you what questions about the case do you want answered? Using the hashtag Ask Colleen, give us your feedback on Facebook or Twitter. Coming up in less than three minutes, Colleen will answer some of those questions for you. You asked us questions about the Avery case on Facebook and Twitter. And so Colleen is here to answer a couple that came up quite a bit. And one of them, how could investigators interview Brendan Dassey without a parent or a lawyer there? After all, Colleen, he was just 16 at the 16 time. 16 years old. And you know, Joyce, actually the law allows police to question kids without a parent or a lawyer present, though the rule is with adults. If a juvenile asks for a lawyer, the questioning should stop. Now, this is interesting. It's thanks to Dassey's uncle, Stephen, that we actually have that video of his interrogation. Now, after Avery's exoneration, the legislature passed a law. It requires interrogations to be recorded, and that's what we're watching right there. Right, all interrogations. And Colleen, we hear this a lot, too. Uh, Avery was looking at a substantial payout, millions, for his wrongful conviction when this murder happened. And people wonder, how could he do this? Right. Well, we had so much to lose, right? Some people have come right out and asked, 
who would be that stupid, right? And so we're going to actually answer the question some of you asked. How intelligent is Stephen Avery? And making a murderer suggests his IQ was about 70. He was intellectually challenged. That's considered borderline. He did poorly in school, was in classes for the learning disabled. And according to court records, he lacked coping skills. They also show that he was in classes for uh, learning disabled kids and did not do well at all. All right, we talked about it, a, a new trial. Ultimately, if he got a new trial, what would it take for a different outcome. Yes. You watched the okay. last one. You, as you know, it's tough to get a new trial without some blockbuster new evidence, mm -hmm. a confession from somebody else, an eyewitness who would come forward, or of course, there's always that option with some sort of advanced uh, forensic science, as you saw with the DNA, which wasn't available in 1985 when he was convicted of the rape he didn't commit. So something like that could happen. Of course, that might get him a new trial. Whether or not he would be vindicated at that time is unclear, but his flamboyant new attorney says she won't quit. Until and he's you'll out. keep covering it.